going to do today is Alan and I are lucky enough to come from a long line of problem solvers. And um, I just had a quick look back at your granddad's book, which is his memoir called um, Can Make Anything But Money, which is, has been, unfortunately, fairly true in our family line. But that's because we're very creative and we make we make anything that we need, we make, and um, none of us will take no for an answer, will we, Al? No. If, if somebody says something can't be done, that we see as a challenge. And, and actually, I find that very tr that triggering, but in a really good way. When somebody says, you can't do that, I say, well, why not? And I go and look at, at why not. So what we're doing today is trying to explain for people who maybe don't... Uh, don't have the lucky gene or only have half the lucky gene, how it's possible to sort of exercise that ability, because we don't know whether it's genetic nature or nurture, do we, Al, to be honest? Um, no. So, yeah? Yeah, well, no, that, that's absolutely right. And I think um, everybody's different in, in the way that they create, I think. Um, some people will find it incredibly easy to naturally um, start creating, but then find themselves in, in some kind of writer's block or creative block at some point. Other people will find it hard to start, but once they get going, it, they'll, they'll find it easy to continue and just everything flows from there. So I think everybody's different. And um, I have to admit to being a little bit um, apprehensive, if not excited, for, for this conversation, because... Yeah, we're presenting a topic on creativity to a, an audience of creatives, um, and I'm I'm very conscious. I don't want to tell anybody how to do that. I don't want anybody to change their their process of creativity, and yeah. it would be wrong for me, for as somebody um, who comes from a, a technical background, the, I, I do technical things for a living, to to start telling creatives how to create. That would be that would be kind of ludicrous. Um, <laughs> However, but you, we can all, I just oh, sure, go on. Put yeah. this in that you did. I, I mean, you don't remember you when you were little as well as I do. And you always w did say to me you wanted to be an inventor. And I know I've said this before on the previous chat. So you just took that fork in the road into the technical side and into working for somebody else. But you could just as easily have taken the other fork, I think, Al. So, you know. Well, uh, I, I, me being me, it probably always would have been something um, of a technical nature. But creativity is creativity, whether you're creating a work of art or, or creating a, a product. Um, so with that in mind, I think everybody at some point finds it difficult to create. Um, I've come from a, um, a background where I've had to deal with other people um, as part of a team trying to solve problems or create something. And often you've got to kind of get together in a scrum and try and solve a problem together. And you have all manner of different personalities, different ways of, of doing things that you kind of have to shepherd into this creative process. So I've got some ideas um, myself about um, how to do that with others. But you yeah. and, and many of the people watching will be doing this yourself. So I thought... Perhaps to start, I'd like to, to ask you how you go about creating. What's, what's your process? Ah, yeah. Well, I go through, I have sort of biorhythmic sort of things. I don't know whether, I know that they're not monthly now. I used to think that they were monthly, but these days they're more, they're just more to do with the weather and whatever. So I have ups and downs. And I think those ups and downs are really important because without downs, you can't, Without valleys, you can't see the mountains, basically. So what happens is I have periods where I do allow, now allow the writer's block thing. Um, and I, I almost welcome it as a break. But the problem is that when I'm trying to communicate with other people who want me to be on my A game, that means that I'm either, I, I feel guilty that I'm not on my A game. So what I do, is I sometimes keep things back and um, and trigger them to order. But the main way that I work for myself is to allow an idea to come and uh, being challenged 
is the very best way for me to, to allow ideas to come, which is why I found myself absolutely happy in the zone where I was doing Hello uh, Maya, where I was doing the um, Challenge Angie series for the Dolls House and Miniature Scene magazine. Um, because that gave me somebody else wanted something that they didn't know how to do and it gave me an opportunity to go away and think um that's so that that's it when when something can't be done i like to do it and then what happens is when when i'm under pressure especially if i've got a miniatures fair to do or whatever i find that my mind is working very very fast and making connections very very fast so once I've done one thing, once I've solved one problem, the other problems associated just naturally come. And I really welcome that. So I keep a piece of paper by my bed and I write notes and I've got stacks of notebooks full of full of daft ideas. I even did a section on my Patreons group, in, on my patron, Patreon page, which was called Daft Ideas Daily. But the problem was those ups and downs and, the, mm. and where a great slew of daft ideas would come in um, over a period of two weeks. I might then have another month with no ideas at all. So I couldn't really keep that up. But that's what I do. I let a question in and then I, I sort of extrapolate from that question to all the other questions. And I do do a lot of hundred day things now. Because right. I find that that gives you the question to un to answer. So I did a hundred days on flower making, where I forced myself past the first hurdle, and then I had to keep on doing things. So even if I didn't want to, I had to produce a flower design every day or a leaf design every day. And of course, Frank had to do that with me because we worked together as a pair. So, and, and, and that was very, very good at exercising our creativity and also our teamwork, because we started off arguing like cat and dog about how things <laughs> were done. And then we ended up saying, ah, I know how this is done. And, and Frank will end up knowing, ah, I know Angie wants me to go to botanical references and, and that kind of thing. So that, that problem solving thing actually overflowed into team working as well. Mm. Interesting. So a couple of things I picked up early on in, in, in what you were just saying. So you're at the mercy of when creativity comes to you to some degree. Um, well, I you, allow myself you go through these. Yeah, that's fair enough. When you were doing your challenge, Angie, you it sounds like you didn't find that too difficult to create on demand. And perhaps that was because somebody had given you some inspiration um and you were able to work from that outwards um yeah. and that's that that's really interesting to 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 um to see that um to see that happen um but at the same time you've struggled when you've kind of had to work on demand on a daily basis without much inspiration that's when you've you've struggled to, to <laughs> come up with something new yes is that yeah. is that fair to say absolutely yeah, perfect. Mm. Interesting. Um, Vicky has commented, she also says that ups and downs are a huge part of the creative brain process. Um, so it sounds like um, this is a reasonable thing that everybody experiences, that uh, creativity either comes or it doesn't. Well, yes. And, and let me just put one more point in. You have a nine to five job. Mm -hmm. Nine to five forces you out of that but also means that you have to, you, you will spend days not being as good at work as, as your boss wants you to be. Mm -hmm. um, so I think nine to five can be a good thing in that you, you are forced every day to do something. Um, but on the other hand, it might stifle your creative flow because you're forced to do what your boss wants. Yeah, absolutely. And and that can be, um, I, I'm kind of lucky, I think. Um, and, and most people in the sort of industry I work in uh, work for organisations that embrace a little bit of creativity and, and are not very prescriptive about, well, you go and sit at your desk and this is your job for the day. They are a bit more flexible. They understand one day you'll be working on getting through a, a 
list of calls that you've got to make or something like that. And then another day you might be a little less busy and you've got some time to, to, to create. But one thing's for sure in, in the industry I work for is occasionally you find yourself in a situation where you have a problem in front of you that you are forced to solve and solve quickly. Yeah. Um, and that can be stress-inducing and you've got to force some creativity out of you in an environment where creativity isn't... When you're in that pressure situation, creativity is the last thing on your mind, um, but you've yeah. got to do it. And you, yeah. people will either be able to deal with that naturally or they need some encouragement. And especially when you're in a team of people, you want everybody to be able to deal with that, uh, with that creative problem. Um, and you've yeah. got to take some time to, to embrace that. I've been talking to an illustrator this morning who she wanted to know about pricing. But in fact, I was thinking about illustrators because illustrators will often get um, a, a brief and they have to work to that brief. Mm. So that that means I mean, most of us do sometimes have to work to a brief, even even if we don't take commissions as such. So um, how do we open our minds for that? Uh, well, I think that's pretty much what I'm going to be um, uh, leading us through. So if it's OK with you, we can we can make a start on that, if you like. Let's um, do that. And we can go through what I call a creative problem solving process. So hopefully everybody can can see that. I'm also hoping it's the right way round for everybody. Last time I had to to write things backwards, but I think I've solved that, uh, that problem <laughs> technically this time. Um, yeah. So this is the the creative process i've called it creative problem solving but really this is the same even if you're creating something from scratch and not even thinking about it you start off with what i've called a problem statement here but in reality you your problem statement might be quite um uh, open it might be quite free or it might be something like a rigid brief that you were talking about and one right. of the things that you can do with that problem statement is embrace it as inspiration rather than um, worry about uh, how that constrains you. So can we have, a, can we have a, uh, an example of a problem statement? Because that, that's uh, corporate speak to, to a lot of us old ladies and, and maybe a lot of the creative community who have never worked some of us have never worked in industry it can be anything it can be literally anything so it can be something very narrow I have a uh, every time I bake my miniatures in the oven this cracks how do I right. solve that so you write down the problem you've got yeah it can be that can be a very narrow problem like that it can be I want to create something new today and I'm actually going to run us through this creative problem solving process today. So the problem sta um, statement we're going to have today is a very wide one. Yeah. I want to create a new product that's going to make me rich. Right. Okay. I think so most of us will, will understand that one. Uh, some of us, some some of us will say. Uh, we had a conversation. I had a conversation with Lisa the other day, and she said, "Well, I don't really worry about money." Um, and and problem is that some of us don't have to but a lot of us do so saying well it's not all about money is just it's that's a no-no because it isn't just not all about money it depends on your circumstances so if it's not all about money great um but this is a brilliant one for us to do because many of us actually need to build our businesses so we do have to think about money so we do have to make sure that our next product is going to be successful, whether it's physical or whether it's a service or a or some other creative good like a performance or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and and I want to I want to be as open with this today as possible. But it might be that you're deliberately looking at something that fits in um, that strategically aligns with what you already do, which is more corporate speak. But something if you're a yeah painter you're probably thinking about doing another painting if you're a, a miniaturist you're probably thinking about doing um uh doing a, a, a new small thing um or but, a diorama um, 
Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but today we're going to keep it as, as open as possible so that everybody can yeah. join in with, with, this, with this process. Yeah. Um, so just simply, we're going to create a new product and it's going to make us rich. Okay. Good one. Like we, then, we then go through a process of divergent thinking. And everybody does this. And you might not be aware that you're doing it as you're creating. But you will sit there and you'll think about all of the possibilities that are in front of you. Um, and sometimes that flows very naturally and it just kind of happens. And sometimes you hit this block um, where you can't um, actually... Um, move beyond and, and you, you're struggling to expand your horizons and thought process. And we'll, we'll come to this and look at how you get around that in, in a moment. So um, would you call that a sticking point? Call it sticking point, um, writer's block, creative block. Right, um, right. And there is a reason um, why that happens and I will, I will talk about that um, in a moment. Um, one thing that we often forget as creatives is we then have to converge our thinking. Right. And for most people who, who exist in the world, the divergent thinking is the hard part and the convergent thinking is the easy part. Right. But for creatives, it's probably the other way around. The divergent yeah. part is probably the easy part and the, and the convergent part is the hard part. But we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. And then eventually we're narrowing this down onto the solution and that solution is to the problem statement so hopefully by the end of today we've got a product that's going to make us rich yeah we, we'll find out how successful we've been at the end of this uh, at the end of this conversation or maybe at the end of the year when people come back to us and say that sparked an idea in me and and i'm now rich I, I hope so. If that happens, that'd be brilliant. Um, and, yeah, you can um, buy us a coffee then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My, my cut's going to be very, very, very modest. So um, don't yeah. worry about that. <laughs> um, you may or may not be aware of this concept. Um, they call it left brain and right brain. Um, have you heard about that? Before? Yes, 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 yes. It's on my. It's on one of my graphics. The the pricing for left brained uh, or whatever. Camera okay, brain, so brain right. it's. <laughs> I I don't particularly like talking about it because I'm a scientist and scientifically it's kind of nonsense. Yeah. But actually, yeah. it's quite informative that you do have different modes of thinking, um, and yeah. they are scientifically. Um, different parts of your brain that, that handle these things. It's just not necessarily perfectly left brain and right brain. But it's a really informative thing to, to think about. You, at any one time, you're either thinking logically or creatively. Yeah. And quite often, the creative block process will be because you are stuck in, in left brain thinking. Right. And what, what I said... Um, uh, earlier on is that we have to try and free ourselves from that during the divergent thinking process. We have to move yeah. into that creative thinking. But when we're in the convergent process, when we're whittling down our ideas, we have to start thinking logically again. Yeah. So right. is there any is there any link between I, I'm just thinking about people who have um, who tend to have negative or pessimistic thinking? Is there is there any link between what you're talking about and that? I'm I'm not a psychologist. However, I would say yes. One of the things that is is obvious is if you're stressed and thinking rigidly about a problem, yeah. you are going to be thinking logically how to solve that problem, and it's not always the the right way of of thinking, especially right. if it's a creative problem. Yeah. Um, and. I, I do mention this a bit later on, and we'll come to it again. Stress is the killer of creativity. Yeah. Anxiety is the killer of creativity. So you've always got to free yourselves from that point of view of it's really important that I manage to fix this problem because you yeah. will be focusing on the rules that you've set yourself rather than the possibilities. Yeah, there's a really, really interesting thing. And we're going to be talking to Lucy about stress at some point um, in the next few weeks. Um, but 
uh, there is a thing that I picked up on a, on one of the things that I posted in the creative business group, which was from a TED talk. And it's about that fight or flight thing. Your brain narrows to the, the flight, basically, and, and how to get over this scary situation. So that's why when you're stressed, it kills creativity because you can't be open. You can only focus on on the fear and and escaping the fearful situation. So mm -hmm. that's why that happens. Yeah. So as we move through this, keep in mind this sort of left brain and, and right brain concept, and we'll um, you'll you'll find that informative. So yeah. I mentioned the the first step on the on the um, process is defining the problem. So this is a logical thought. What are your objectives? What do I need to do today? But in order to try and minimize that stress and that restriction in your thought process, you keep your rules to a bare minimum. If yeah. it's I need to create a painting, you, you don't necessarily want to say it's got to be a painting of a woman that does this, unless that is the commission that you've been given. Yeah. You expand you, you want to be able to expand from this point on. So the rules should only be what's essential to, to complete the task. Nothing extraneous. No, I've done it this way before, so I'm going to do it this way again. The, the, kind of got to block that out of your, of your thought process. And there's some ways that we can, we can do that um, as, as I'm going to come to. But the, the problem, as we've defined it today, I'm going to make a new product that's going to make me rich. So right. two, two things there. That we're um, that we're that we're trying to to achieve. So we now have to encourage our creative thinking in order to move into that divergent thinking mode, and you've got to change your way of thinking before you do that. And for creative types, you're probably in this creative mode already. But if you're in writer's block or creative block, it might be that you're stuck in a logical thinking mode. And how do you free yourself from do that? from doing that and there's a there's a few ways that you can do it i've mentioned already tension stress and fear of failure kill creativity so you want to be as open as possible to the possibilities um, and if you're managing a team um, that means that you can't sit there and say no we've got to get this done this is this is essential we've, we've got to solve this problem and I don't want to hear anything that's nonsense. It's, it's very much got to be a no wrong answers kind of thought process. And yeah. if it's just yourself, you've got to free yourself and say, it doesn't matter if I think of something stupid, I'm going to explore that possibility anyway. And there are, there are things we can do to, um, to trigger that. And before we get into the actual divergent thinking phase, I think we can play a few of these um, creativity games, these right brain trigger games. Um, so feel free to uh, to join in as you're watching this and um, and and give us any comments that uh, that you come up with at this point. So and if anybody's thing, watching later, play along and let us know if you can get through to us. If you can find where we are, please play along and let us know how it goes for you, because we'd be interested. So first thing. Uh, I want to explore this possible this concept of left brain and right brain thinking. You've probably played this game before. You've probably seen it on the internet, um, but we're going to have a look at it anyway. Um, the idea behind this, the left side of your brain is focused on processing information, being logical and reading. The right side is triggered by visual stimulus and um, emotion and things like that. So you've probably seen this before. You have to look at what I hold up to the camera and I want to, you to say the colour that you see, not read the oh, word. Oh, yes. All right? Yeah. So are you ready for this? Yes. I want you to be as fast as you can. Oh, dear. <laughs> Red. <laughs> Green. <laughs> Oh, now I've got to <laughs> right. green. Uh, red. <laughs> I wasn't very fast though, was I? Red. Pink. No, it's actually pink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll give you the benefit of the doubt with that. Green. One. 
Yep. <laughs> but unfortunately, you've got. I'm pretty good at this anyway. So orange. Yeah. Black. Excellent. Brilliant. We'll leave it there. But the problem is I'm really good at that, so I'm not the best person to show that it sometimes works the other way. Of course, and that's probably because you're primarily a, a creative thinker, so you probably find that easier than somebody who's um, a primarily logical thinker. That I'm said, a colorist. if you, if, yeah, and if, if you did struggle with that at, at home, don't let that worry you. Everybody thinks differently, and even if you primarily think logically... I probably primarily think logically, doesn't mean you can't train yourself to think creatively as well. But that, that's a really good game because it demonstrates the, uh, the difference between your left brain and your right brain. Um, but it's not necessarily the m easiest way to change the way of, of, of thinking. So we've, we've got uh, another game to, uh, to, to play, Stick Holder. Uh, it's a beach ball on, the, on a beach. Okay, it's uh, an earring um, that uh, you can just see the bottom half of it, but the person who's wearing the earring has a green head. It's my father's foot. Excellent. Um, it is a alien, and you can just see its eye. It's a dog with its nose pressed against the screen. And do you know what I love about what we're doing right now? You're getting more and more abstract as you go through it and more and more divorced from the reality. Um, right. And I love that. That is exactly what we want. I'm struggling with that. I'm saying what I see. You're becoming much, much more abstract and, um, and thinking about it. <laughs> Penny says this is a piece of cheese. I, brilliant. I don't see it, but that's great. I, I, can, see, I can see a piece of cheese, yes. Well, you, you asked for the wrong answers. Absolutely, and, oh, yeah. Pe Penny's a neuro-linguistic programming, some kind of neuro-linguistic pro programming. She, she studied it. I don't know whether she teaches it. But. Brilliant. Excellent. Um, yeah. Okay, so we can uh, grass on a snail a snail house. I've never even heard of a snail house, but that's brilliant. A snail uh, house is the thing that it carries on its back. Oh, yeah, of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like it's, that. It's a juggernaut. <laughs> ah, yes. Um, um, am I supposed to come up with another one? It's Christmas wrapping paper with a piece of... Mm. Oh, God, what's it called? I can't remember. Piece of cheese on it. Oh, somebody said cheese. Remember, it's a no wrong answers kind of thing. So That's don't true. feel like you can't say something somebody else has ever said. There's no rules. Well, yes, because creators, they, they, there's an expression, artists steal. And it doesn't mean that artists plagiarise. It actually means that artists steal good ideas. Mm. So if a good idea from somebody else's work comes into your head and you put it together with another one and make something completely different, that's certainly a, um, that's certainly in the in the rule book for creative thinking, isn't it? Mm. In science, that's uh, standing on the shoulders of giants, as they say. Uh -huh. I'm going to write that down. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Rita says, for snails without a house to live in, that's what a snail house is. And I think... Not only is that um, a wonderfully creative concept, um, it's also a cause I can get behind. Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the, the next game then. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give a little bit of a shout out to um, a book that I read called Improv Wisdom. Um, yeah. I read this a few years ago and it, it wasn't necessarily a, a new concept to me, but... Um, it basically explored how improv people, comedians that, that do improv or, or actors that do improv, um, how they go through the creative process quickly, rapidly, um, and, and are completely free from this fear of failure. But then they can start to um, incorporate rules. And you'll, you'll be aware of this if you've ever seen any improv act or... Um, whose line is it anyway, or something like that, that they can be really, really sort of rapid and creative. Um, and it's quite a fascinating um, process to watch. 
Yeah, um, have I got news for you? We watched this morning. Yeah, That's and uh, as uh, pretty improv. Yeah, the, the some of these panel shows are sort of mock um, uh, improvisation. They've got some material. They know what's going to come up, and they've got things written down, and that's fine for the for the sort of work they do. But some sometimes it is really off the cuff. It's really kind of yeah. witty, um, and it's a difficult thing to do. But th that doesn't come naturally to them. They have to exercise that, um, and they play these sorts of games that we've been doing. And one of those games that um, they do is Word at a Time. And we, you've probably played games like this as a kid. And I remember it as, and I hope you remember it too, um, uh, I went to the zoo. Yes. So... I do it with, with English classes. I went to the market and I bought that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly, that kind of thing. And, and you normally sort of... The, the game, as you remember it as children, is that you've always got to add a word and make it longer and longer. We don't want any rules, if you remember. We want it to be as creative as possible. If you're stuck, the simple thing is add a word. If you want to change a word, that's fine. If you want to delete a word, that's fine. If you want to start afresh, that's fine. Oh, I so like this. Let's, let's try this. And I'm, I'm a little bit um, nervous, and I shouldn't be. There's no wrong answers. Um, <laughs> let's give it a go. So I'll, I'll start off. I went to the zoo, and I saw a cat. I went to the zoo and I saw a cat carrying an ice cream. I went to the zoo and I saw a cat wearing an ice cream cone as a hat. I went to the zoo and I saw a, a cat wearing a hat with a feather and carrying an ice cream because I want that ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I s went to the zoo and I saw a cat wearing a bird as a hat. And the bird was carrying the ice cream. Can we have some answers, people? Because I, <laughs> I went to the zoo and I saw a cat carrying an ice cream, wearing a bird on its head as a hat and poking its paw through a lion's cage. I went to the zoo and I saw the lion scare the bird and the bird flew away, but the cat couldn't get away from the bird, so had to be dangling from the bird as the bird was flying. Wow, that's a good story. Do you do this for <laughs> writing? Do you do this for story writing as well? Is this one of the things that story writers do? I guess you could. Um, it's, a, it's a good thing for divergent thinking um, in general. But really, at the moment, we're, we're not even going through that process. We're just changing ourselves into this creative mode there's no rules right. do you see what i'm saying so yeah, once, yeah. We're, once we've done this we're now prepared to kind of write a story penny says <laughs> penny says i went to the zoo and saw a cat limping because of the weight of the hat that's um, a good one i like rita ah, says the cat and the boots. cat wore boots yeah yeah brilliant I, I i love this because this actually is now going to lead us quite nicely into the divergent thinking process because that is exactly what we've just done so we're ready to be creative and if you remember our brief we want to build a new product that's going to make us rich and we've got some tools in our in our box that we're going to uh, we're going to use for, for doing this thing i'm going to go through all of these things in turn but to start with i want Ordinarily, we'd start off with a brief that we might have. I want to, uh, if you're a painter, you might have a commission of some painting you've got to do. If you're a um, miniaturist, you might have an idea of the sorts of things people might like to see. So you'd probably start off with inspiration from that. Challenge Angie was a, your muse was the challenge that you'd been set. Yeah. We're a little bit um, more open-minded today. We've got less constraints placed upon us. So I want you to basically find any mundane object around you, um, something that you have next to you, something that you use, a stapler. Excellent. So we've got some tools that we can use um, to explore this new product that we're going to create. Yes. First one in there is mind maps. 
and this is quite a good thing to to start off as a basis for everything because we want to kind of record what we're doing a mind map if you're not aware of it is basically just writing down what you see um and links across it and and the other tools that we um that we um have in our toolbox here feed into that a little bit because they're all diverging and a mind map is a good way of representing that diverging so you start off with i'll i'll show you this um in a moment as we go through this but um we record every thought that spreads out from that uh, from that central point yeah so what can we use to inspire our divergence from that the first thing we can do yeah, you can do it like that if you like. I'm going to move to my uh, my whiteboard in a, in a moment as we go through doing this. So things that we can do with this stapler. You can hold it in your hands. You can understand it. Um, you can get connected to that. We call that examining its attributes. So it's got a hinge on it, right? Yeah. It's got... Um, uh, um, you can open it up to put the staples in. It's got certain attributes. It feels hard. Um, and we can use that as inspiration. We can use morphology. What happens if we changed that um, stapler in some way? Um, what could we do with it? Um, what would that change about it? What don't we like about it? We can be really creative and visualize it in different areas. Um, we can imagine what it would be like if it was red. We can kind of picture it and see how that makes us feel. We can use yeah. reverse assumptions. So what if it wasn't loaded with staplers, but was loaded uh, staples, but was loaded with drawing pins? Could that help? Um, what if it didn't staple, but it de-stapled? Well, for our purposes, there is already a de-stapler, but it, we can reverse assumptions. Yeah. We can put it in new contexts. We can say it's no longer on Angie's desk, but it is in an industrial setting. Or what happens if I need to staple on the go? Um, kind of things like that. And we've got um, new relationships. For new relationships, you tend to, it helps if you've got other muses around you. But um, say I've got the stapler in front of me and I've got this guitar. I could staple my guitar. Remember, there are no wrong answers at this stage. We're divergently thinking. So we would still write down staple the guitar on our mind map. Well, yeah, I mean, I could use the staples uh, on a miniature guitar to make the frets. Excellent. Brilliant. I mean, so we've already started this. So I want to um, move to my whiteboard um, so we can start to, uh, to, to join this together. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. Yes, I can see, yeah, I can see all of it. I'm going to draw a stapler. And we're going to start doing these things around it. So let's start off with some um, attribute examination. Tell me what you fit, think and feel about that stapler. What's... Well, it's black. Yeah. yeah, okay, carry on. Um, black's, black's quite a sexy colour. So we're actually expanding from that because black, sexy, cool, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's reasonably heavy. Mm -hmm. um, it opens out, which I found interesting, right out, so that maybe... Well, that's the so that, so maybe well, you're not ready for that. Yeah, I, no wrong answers, keep going. If you've got a so okay, that... Okay, so that, so that my feeling was that you could maybe use it if you banged it in, uh, as a stapler straight into things without using the bottom, that the, the bottom sort of curls the staples in, but maybe you could use it like a stapled gun by banging it. Hmm. And that makes us think about staple gun. Um, yeah. But we have a problem with staple guns, that staples guns don't curl the staple back round. 
That's right, yeah. So we've, we're now doing attribute analysis on some of the product, but that's okay. This is, this is now the, um, the sort of uh, new relationship thinking. So um, I've got something this. else that um, it's full of different part, interesting parts. Like it's got a nice spring and it's got this, this bit that curls the staples in, which is, which at one, in one way looks like a face, but it's also looks like something I could remove. In fact, I can remove it. Ooh, if I, if I try and, no, it won't come off, but um, it looks like it might, it might be full of parts for doing other things with. There's a nice long spring in here. So I'm really interested in its separate elements. And miniaturists do that naturally. We, we take things apart. You might not be able to see on that, but my mind map is starting to now connect up in certain ways. So I've got the staple curler that... Uh, that uh, uh, you... yellow, yellow isn't visible. You can't use yellow. OK, no problem. Um, I'll draw it. I'll draw it instead. Um, uh, purple's not very good either. No. <laughs> I have that problem with my board, uh, with my... I've got a box of board colours and they don't work on video, unfortunately, most of them. There we go. That's a staple colour that looks like a face. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that links... Yours is in... square. Mine is round. OK. So that's that's morphology. What if it was round? What if it was square? What if it was a triangle? Yeah. Um, the open stapler we mentioned can't curl. Excellent. Right. Um, can I can I give you Rita's um, comments on this? Rita please says please. it's a boring boring product but functional. I would make it in bright colours and put an animal head on it instead of staples. Oh, sorry, on it. Instead of staples, it can take bites out of paper in different shapes. Great fun. <laughs> so, Brilliant. So, yes, the Japanese make those, actually. The Japanese do make, um, well, it, it's like a, a cross between a stapler and, uh, and a, hot, um, a paper punch. And there's one that I bought while I was in Japan that has like an arrow shape on it. And you punch it into paper and it, the arrow shape comes out and it sort of holds another piece of paper. So, it, so it's like a stapler that turns into a paper clip. It's very interesting. So there have been, there've been people who thought about these problems before. <laughs> Excellent, really good. Um, any other thoughts? Remember, we've got some other tools in our toolbox. We've got um, reverse assumption. So what if it, well, we already kind of did that. It's black. Um, what if it wasn't black? What if it was colorful? Um, but we can- What if it unstapled? Yeah. Yeah, what if it unstapled? Um, I, in fact, I'm gonna write that down. What if it was a stapler that could also unstaple? Yes. And and Rita's thing of what if it punched holes? Did you did you put that one? What if it punched holes? Yeah, okay. Um, not necessarily ordinary holes, but interesting holes, different shape. What if you made a stapler that would, could do all those things at once? A bit like a smartphone does all the smartphoney things that we are used to. So a stapler that was also a, a paper punch and an unstapler. You could slide, you could Sorry. slot in and out. Stapling, um, punching holes, unstapling, all of all of these three, three things in once. Yeah, you could slot in and out um, cartridges into this same base stapler shape that mm -hmm. did different things. Yeah, oh, so um, I'm gonna write that down. Um, there's different ways that can be done, slots and cartridges. Yeah. That staples oh, more interesting than I thought,
a salon. I'm sounding northern when I say a salon. <laughs> this, this, this stapler is much more interesting than I thought. Exactly. Exactly. And what we've done here is, <laughs> and it was always going to be a little bit of a risk when, when you say creativity comes as and when it comes, you kind of got to ride these waves. So it was always a little bit of a risk when we came into, um, into this saying um, that absolutely, um, as a rule, uh, you can be creative on demand. But I think with the inputs that we've had between us and with the contributions we've had live, we've kind of shown that you can encourage creativity with these things that are in your toolkit. Yes. So I'm going to, we could do this, and, and ordinarily if I was um, in a meeting um, with a team and we were trying to come up with a, a creative solution, I wouldn't put a time limit on this. We would go on and on and on until we were basically bored to tears. Um, <laughs> until coffee time. Until coffee time. Until everybody demanded coffee. Exactly. I'm, I'm not going to do that today um, for the sake of time. We could carry on to the nth degree, but we've actually already got some brilliant ideas on the board from that creative process. And we've, we've fallen back on these tools. There have been a couple of moments when we've kind of gone, mm, what are we going to do now? And we'll look back and we'll say, okay, reverse assumptions or examine its attributes or change something or place it somewhere else. We didn't even really look at new contexts. Um, yeah. But for example, if we had a um, a... Uh, a stapler that could punch holes and remove staples in one, where would that be useful? And you could, in an office, that's really useful. But what about um, on trains or airlines where you've got people who need to staple documents or remove staple documents or punch holes in a ticket? It could be one tool that could do that. So that would be like a new context for this kind of tool. Yeah. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, we now have to get real. Oh. <laughs> and we've got a rather disapproving um, looking face there. You've had far too much fun. So we oh. need to start thinking rationally again. I'm not going to run through any games to start us thinking rationally again, because it's going to be quite boring for us if we do that right now. However, we do need to start thinking logically again. And if you if you if you're really excited, you need to bring yourself back to back to earth. There are things you can do: sit and do a Sudoku puzzle, look at maths problems, read a newspaper article, something like that, just to bring yourself back down to to earth a little bit. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Lisa has said, "Why do we want to bring ourselves back down to earth?" I love staying in that energy. And yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, by all means, if you've got as much time to to play with as you can. Yeah, if you don't have to go to can. work. Yeah. If you don't uh, have to go to work, it doesn't matter if you sleep. Yeah, indeed. But sometimes, certainly for me, I work for a company that ultimately wants to see some productivity from it. So we have to get a little bit rational about it. And so we get into that convergent thinking again. So just to um, test you, um, what's 17 times three? I have no idea. No, honestly, I don't do maths. Can you write it down? No. No, it's not, no, it's not something I, I... Well, I. what I would do, I'll tell you what I would do. I'd put 17, 17, 17. Yep. And then add, add the three sevens. So I'd go 7 and 7 is 14, and another 7 makes 21. So then I'd put the 2, 3, 4, 5. That's how I'd do it, 51. Okay. okay. I'm, not, I'm not really mathematical, so I have to do everything as, um, as a sort of visual thing. Sure. And that's absolutely fine. And I think you came to the right answer. Um, but that, that's uh, you. what you are doing there is you're putting yourself back into that mode of, of rational thought. Oh, um, right. Yeah, with you. But what we need to do is whittle down these ideas. We need to refine these ideas, which are practical. How would we actually execute on them? So let's go back to my, um, to my whiteboard. Um, yeah. I'll try and bring this a little bit closer. So very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Penny did come with another good one. She said she would make a stapler that was used in the garden, not as a stapler, but as a mechanism uh, to hold plants, canes, or implements together. Excellent. So, oh, right. So, yeah. 
So that's a new context for it. Um, yeah. yeah. And we've got this kind of nice colourful um, picture now, but we can maybe perhaps list some of these things that we saw. So we, we quite liked the, um, the, this, this section here where we said that there's a tool that can do lots of different things. I'll try and represent this uh, um, later in a, in a more easy to read um, mind map. But yeah. as well as punching holes, we can, um, uh, sorry, yeah, as well as stapling, we can punch holes and remove staples. We kind of like that with some method of changing it, slotting in a cartridge or moving a wheel or something like that. So there's yeah. one, yeah. What should we call that? Should we call that a multi-tool? Uh, um, yes, the multi-punch or multi-staple. Yeah, okay. I'm we, sure there are many things called multi-tools, multi-punch, multi-staple. Yeah, we had um, animal heads um, and more colorful to make them more interesting. I, you can't see me writing there because I'm too close. Um, yes. Uh, we have garden stapler right at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a concept that we didn't really explore that much, um, but we had... Um, this idea here, sorry, I'll try and show you. There was an open, that it opens wide, but if you open it wide, we can't curl it. So we're kind of wanting a best of both worlds staple gun with the strength of a staple gun, but a yeah. way of lining it up um, so that it can curl around the other side. So I'm sure that they they must exist in um, in large sizes in industry because I've seen them in, um, for example, in strawberry boxes and things like that. So I think I've yeah. seen something that that's w working on that scale. But that could be for for in a less industrial setting for home use, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. So we've got four ideas there, really, um, that we've whittled ourselves down to. Um, it's probably a topic for another, another time, but that's when you'd start to evaluate your options. You'd go, OK, now I've got these ideas. They're, they're really rational. How achievable is, is each one of these things? How um, how would I go about doing all of these things? And we can see actually on that on that list. If I go back to it, some of them are relatively easy. Putting an animal head on a on a stapler and making it colourful is quite easy. A garden stapler could potentially just be a larger stapler. It's relatively yeah. easy to to do something with. Yeah. Multi-tool stapler, perhaps a little bit more complicated. We've got to figure out how we can um, do those things um, in an easily changeable way. And then lastly, we've got the open but curling stapler that's, um, that can be used for home use, so the best of both worlds between a staple gun. We don't really have the answer to how that would be done, so that I've, might not I be achieved. I think I've got it. I think I've got it. Brilliant. I think <laughs> I think I've got a simultaneous, as it goes in, there's a simultaneous thing that comes in from both sides to, to bring that, to start that curl. Once yes, but how, do you get, how do you do that when things are different sizes? It's okay if everything's big. Uh, sorry, if everything's think, yeah, kind of big size. Could you align it with magnets or something like that? Could you have a magnetic alignment that yeah. stapled but it? But that's not convergent now, so we, we've got to move on, I'm afraid. Exactly, now. yeah. I mean, soon, sooner or later, you kind of got to, got to set your stall out. Um, that, that, that can actually be a bit of a problem because um, we now have to be productive. We've got to meet our brief. And um, we always want to perfect our ideas. 
Um, and this was another thing that I, I came across in the improv wisdom idea, that good enough is perfect. Yes. So, well, it's a bit like the we don't we don't necessarily agree with him, and sometimes he dri drives us crazy. But the move fast and break things thing that Zuck came out with um, that that if you if you change things and you get something out, you're halfway there, sort of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You can always refine your product at a later date. There's all sorts of things you can that you can do. But what we we had our brief at the beginning of this, which was. Um, money. find a product that's going to make us money. Um, any one of those four, I would argue, could. And so we've met our brief. We don't need to find the perfect product that's going to make us money because that wasn't in our, in our original brief. That wasn't in our problem statement. Our problem statement was find a product that will make money. So how did we do? Are we rich yet? Um, well, no, we're not rich yet. The problems we've only just started. This is the creative process, not the not the product design process, where we start to really get into uh, into the details and nitty gritty of it. But I would argue that there are four ideas there that are worth exploring, that you could turn into something that would make you money. Yeah. I'm not ready to take um, any of them to Dragon's Den yet, but the, I'm, I'm the, happy with what we've done. Can I just bring this back to our audience who are craftspeople and who generally wouldn't want to put a lot of money into their first their first prototype of something. So I just want to 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 say that we are aware that you don't have as a craft craftsperson or as a creative business, you don't have a huge amount of money to put into uh, to product research and, and uh, to making the prototype. So. Yeah. And, and that would start a little bit from your problem statement and your muse. So yeah. your problem statement might be, I want to create a new work of art. And your muse might be either existing works of art or something that's in the, uh, in the real world. And yeah. now you're starting to go through the same process we've just gone through, but with a different focus. We're now thinking, OK, so let's <laughs> we'll, we'll spend five minutes on this now. Um, uh, yeah. And I'll find a um, a mundane object. It's a roll of bin liners. Yeah. And we want to create something um, based on that. As a miniaturist, you're going to look at it and think, okay, I can make a small roll of bin liners. I can make a small bin. I can make small rubbish. I can change something I've got so that it's rubbish. So um, I might have made flowers before. Why am I not making mouldy flowers that need to go in the bin? That's the same process we've just gone through, but with a different brief yeah. and a different, um, a different muse. Um, yeah. And then we narrow it down and say, I could easily make a roll of bin liners or uh, it'd be a bit hard to make mouldy flowers, but it would be a product that people would I've like. I've actually made miniature rubbish. So uh, in, fa in fact, uh, I got a an article published in an American magazine about making miniature rubbish. And I'm not the only person who did it, who's done it either. There's uh, Alex Blythe, she used to be called Alex Blythe, Alex Curtis. She may even have changed her name again. Alex, anyway, she's a very good miniaturist who's done also done miniature rubbish. Sure. And that's pretty much it. That's the, that's the end of the creative process. I suppose uh, something that could follow on from this is how do you go about actually turning these things into product but that's really a an industry that's that you as your in your respective fields know better than i do um but yeah. as long as it's practical as long as it's um uh achievable more than practical actually um yeah. go ahead with it try it see what see what yeah. you can create i think it's a i think it's a, a good place to go well i think our viewers had a lot of fun with the with the with the uh games that you've played and I and and certainly I found it more uh, mind opening than I not no I did expect it to be but you know there were things that I didn't didn't expect I wasn't sitting there thinking oh when's this going to be over I was enjoying the process. <laughs> thank you very much Alan excellent I'm glad you enjoyed it um, uh, 
we'll, we'll, go, we'll circle back to the start of this conversation. I'm not trying to tell anybody how to create. If you're finding yourselves productive and creating well already, then carry on doing what you're doing. You know, there's no need to change what you're what you're doing. But if you find yourself stuck, there are tools that you can do that are out there. I'd love to hear anybody's other ideas of how they trigger um, their creativity. So um, please yeah. send us your comments um, and and share them with your with your fellow creatives, and um, and keep this conversation going because this is this is just a few ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep the minds opening. Yes, I agree with that, Alan. Um, uh, share it either on this group or in your own group, other other groups or wherever, just because creativity, inspiration isn't something that's finite. It's pretty infinite. The more you share it, the more it comes back to you as well. Mm, excellent. Anyway, lots lots of love and lots of thanks for this for this session. I've really enjoyed it. Brilliant. I hope everyone else has. Carry on the conversation. Let us know your thoughts. Um, and uh, I look forward to the next time that we get to speak. Excellent. <laughs> Cheers. See bye you bye. soon. Bye-bye.